Well, dear friends in Christ, grace, you and peace. Amen. Again, Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. It's the start of 2012. It's good to be with you today as we begin this year thinking about new possibilities, new discoveries, maybe a new style of life that's in front of us. I know it's going to be a good year for me. It's going to be a good year for us at Zion. I just hope and pray it's going to be an awesome year for you. Now, as this new year starts, many of you will probably be making New Year's resolutions. Often those kind of New Year's resolutions that people make have to do with turning over a new leaf. Maybe it has to do with exercising regularly, eating right, losing weight. Many of them have to do with improving yourself physically, emotionally, or spiritually, and that's great. The time is ripe right now for New Year's resolutions, and that's all good. I find myself, however, that I each year have really good intentions with my New Year's resolutions, and man, this is going to be the year that I'm going to follow through on each and every one of them. I mean, I've started numerous years just really committed to those New Year's resolutions, and this year I'm going to make them all. My problem in the past is that I'm really good with those resolutions the first two weeks of January. By the last two weeks in January, I'm pretty good with them. By the middle of February, I develop resolution amnesia. And by the end of February, I think to myself, you know, I really made some good New Year's resolutions, but I can't remember what they were. You know, I start to feel like the elder, elderly gentleman, a, a widower, who moved into a memory care center who was very friendly and social. It wasn't long before he had made a number of friends among the residents there. There was a widow there, a woman that he was especially attracted to, and she was attracted to him, and so they started spending a lot of time together over, over meals and morning coffee and, and memory care bingo. And... <laughs> One, one evening, he asked her to marry him, and she enthusiastically said yes. The next morning, he woke up and think, I know I asked her to marry me, but I forgot what she said. And so he, over morning coffee, he said to her, say, I'm really embarrassed about this, but I know I asked you to marry me, but I forgot what you answered. And she said, oh, thank you for reminding me. I know I said yes to somebody, but I couldn't remember who. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the way I feel about my New Year's resolutions at the end of February. I remember that I made them, but I don't always remember what they were. Well, this year, in 2012, starting today, we're starting an eight-week sermon series that I've entitled Beyond Success to Significance. And what we're going to be doing in these next eight weeks is discover biblical insights and life lessons on how to make 2012 a year of living beyond success to significance. At your knee in the, in the brochures, behind the brochures, is just a little uh, uh, flyer for you that talks, that tells about the sermon series, what the titles of the sermons will be over the next eight weeks, and a little bit of Zion Lexnet on, on the back if you're on Facebook, um, like us at Zion Lutheran Corner. I'd suggest you just bring one of these home. Use it as refrigerator art. Just kind of remember, you know, what the sermons are going to be over these next week. Or even better yet, if you have a friend who is kind of wondering about what this next week, next year will bring, just say, hey, this is something we're doing at church, and give it to them and invite them to come to worship with you. 2012 will start here at Zion with talking about some significant issues, about becoming the person God created you to be, finding your true North Star, casting your nets in uncharted waters. So bring this home with you or share it with a friend. And part of the reason we're doing that here at Zion is because over the years, all through the year, I hear people say things like, you know, I'm just stuck in a rut. I just don't 
have a life because I'm so burned out and exhausted. I'm running all the time and I can't seem to get anywhere. Sometimes people say, nobody appreciates me. Nobody values what I do or say. My boss has, doesn't have any clue as to what I'm capable of. Sometimes people say, you know, my spouse doesn't get me, doesn't understand me. Sometimes people say, you know, I wish I were making a difference in life, but I'm not making the difference that I'd like. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm just, I just feel empty inside. Many people say, I feel spiritually empty. I don't feel connected with God like I, like I was at some point, period. Sometimes people say, you know, my life lacks meaning and purpose, and I know something's missing, but I don't know quite what it is, and I don't know how to get it back. You've probably heard someone say something similar to that, or maybe you feel that way yourself. Maybe you're sitting here at the start of a new year, and you just wonder if anything is going to be different over 2012, or any better than it was in 2011. John Maxwell is an author, Christian author, pastor, author that I like to read, and he writes that most people live their lives on one of four levels, all beginning with an S. The first is scramble. He says about 20% of people live in this scramble mode, trying to always meet deadlines, but always being a little bit late, always scrambling to get to work on time, scrambling to be a mom, dad, taxi, to bring your kids to one place or the other. You want to make a list of things that you need to do, and then you lose that list, and so you're always looking for something else. Not quite satisfied with the job you have, but looking for something else. You fall into bed exhausted at the end of the day, and you hope the next day will be any better, but the next day you wake up and scramble again. In the scramble mode, morale is low, and burnout is high, and meaning and purpose in life, when you're scrambling all the time, you just don't get that deeper meaning or purpose in life. Second stage is survival, when you're, when you're still scrambling, but you're hanging on by your fingertips as you fly 90 miles an hour through life, you're surviving, but just barely. You punch the clock on a week, but then you live for the weekends. Your work is fine, but it's not where your passion is. You know, 70% of people in their work, if they could find a different job, would take it. Job satisfaction these days is just at, an, at, at, at a low. People are looking for someone else, something else, not finding it, not really satisfied with what they're doing. They're working and not totally dissatisfied, but when all you can do is survive and um, only worry about getting a paycheck and what's going on the next weekend, that's not a way really to live. The fourth, third level is success, where things are clicking for you, you have a good time with your spouse and family, people at work, neighbors, life is a little bit more relaxed and sometimes more challenging. And there's always that little bit more. When you live for success, there's always that little bit more. Your paycheck's fine, but just a little bit more would make a difference. You have a great house, but you need to remodel. You need to build. You need to move up in the social world. You have all that you need, and it's all very good if it were just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And then you get that, and you set your sights on a little bit higher. That quest for just a little bit more becomes unending when you're in the success mode. And satisfaction is just temporary and fleeting because you get success and then you want just a little bit more. That's the success mode. Fourth mode is the, the mode after scramble, survival, and success is the level of significance. When all cylinders are popping in the same way. When you experience significance in life, you know that whether you're successful or not in the little bit more world, that you're making an impact on people's lives. You're stretching your gifts and abilities to the utmost, and you know that what you're doing is just what God wants you to be doing. Deep down you feel, this is why God created me. This is why God put me on this earth in the first place. When you're working and living with significance, your influence multiplies. Your progress quickens. Results and outcomes go through the roof. 
and people's lives are changed much for the better because you're significantly impacting them. You begin to put a value on impacting people's lives rather than the success that's good but never enough. You move beyond success to a significance. Doesn't happen often, doesn't happen to all people, but isn't that the goal toward which we should reach in 2012? Wouldn't that be something you'd like to experience in your life? I think you can, and that's why we're talking about this over the next eight weeks, Beyond Success to Significance, looking at biblical insights and life lessons from the Bible. My hope and prayer is that you would begin this year making specific steps toward that goal. The first step is pretty simple. Pretty simple. The first step is suggesting that you start each day saying to yourself, I'm a child of God, who belongs to God, who believes in God, and will become the person God created me to be. I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person that God created me to, to be. What if you started the morning brushing your teeth, saying, I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person God created me to be. What if before you went to school or work, and began to relate to a whole lot of people in a whole variety of circumstances? What if you just said to yourself, I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person God created me to be? What if, when you're feeling frustration with your kids, your in-laws, your boss, your, your, your boss, even maybe your spouse, what if before reacting, you said to yourself, you know, I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person that God created me to be. You know, if you did that on a regular basis, you'd reorient your brain, I believe, you'd, you, you, you would alter the way your brain works as you begin to rewrite it and react. Instead of reacting quickly, you say, I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person God created me to be. You know, that's what Psalm 139 said in our first reading. Lord, you've searched me out. Oh, Lord, you've known me. For you yourself created my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in a womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. God knit you together in your mother's womb. You are marvelously made, God eyes, God's eyes beheld you before you were formed. All the days of your life have been written in God's book. That's what the Bible says. It's a little bit scary, but that's what the Bible says. You're a child of the Most High God. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 3.20. He says, now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. If you're a child of the Most High God, where God knit you together in your mother's womb before you were even born, then if God is able to do in you exceedingly, abundantly, far more, than anything you can ask or desire, which is what the Bible says, then what if you grasped onto that of what it really means to be a child of the Most High? I think <laughs> that means you don't sell yourself short. You don't compromise your values. You remember that you never regret taking the high road because you know that when you take the low road, you've often regretted it. I think it means that you remember that you tell the truth. I used to raise my kids telling them, you know, if you don't tell the truth, you're going to get caught. The untruth that you tell will always come out, and the consequences of that will be much worse than telling the truth. You are a child of God. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, 
That means that you are a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and can become the person God created you to be. There's promise and hope, I think, that this next year can be one of significance for you, and it starts with remembering that you are a child of the Most High. Now, like the woman in the memory care unit who forgot who would propose to her, and like I am at the end of February when I can't remember my New Year's resolution, I'd like to give you uh, something that will help you remember that you are a child of God, belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person God made you to be. After the sermon, after the creed, after we sit, I'll give you a little card. On one side of it, it says those words. I'm a child of God who belongs to God, believes in God, and will become the person God created me to be. I suggest that you take three of them. Take each, each of you, take three of them. Do you put one on your mirror when you're brushing your teeth in the morning or putting on your mascara? When you look at it before you go to bed at night, say to yourself, I'm a child of God. I belong to God, I believe in God, and I will become the person God created me to be. Maybe put one on the, on the dashboard of your car or on whatever at work or on your computer monitor. And before you run into a challenging situation, which you will, life is full of challenging situations. Before a stressful meeting, before you push send on that email, before you do that, I'm a child of God. I belong to God. I believe in God. I'll become the person God created me to be. Take a third one, put it in your purse or wallet, give it to a friend, invite him to church, and just Pause and say that and remember it when you, before you rush into something that you might regret or wish you wouldn't have done or wish you wouldn't have said, just remind yourself of that. I'm a child of God, knit together in my mother's womb before time. Before time. 2012 will be a good year, I hope and pray for all of us. And I think remembering who you are as a child of the Most High is an important foundation for a very good 2012. Let's close in prayer. Gracious, loving God, you bless us in so many ways. We thank you. We thank you for 2011. We thank you that there were lots of good things that happened, some things not so good, some things very difficult. But Lord, we, help, we pray that you would help us look forward to the new year when we can get closer to you when we can align our lives according to your will and your way for what you would have us do and how you would have us live. Thank you, dear Lord, for 2011. Thank you, dear God, for 2012. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.